So it's actually like a weird thing when you start studying literature seriously, you start realizing like how fragile texts are and how easily they can get lost to time. Because it's like, what this essay, the fra where the phrase La Vida Total comes from, is a, it's a little bit of prose attached to some poems by Gabriela Mistra, Mistral called Poemes de la Madre Más Triste, or Poems of the Saddest Mother. Um, she, so there's the poems, which I'll translate for y'all. Ah, uh, here they are. I've still got my bookmark in it. Um, unsurprising. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, <laughs> I've got a suffrage commemoration, a woman's suffrage commemoration bookmark in the, uh, because that's, when I was studying this, it's like, it was like the, uh, cent like, uh, I think it was a centennial of, uh, uh, like general woman suffrage in the United States. Um, yeah, so before we get into the essay, I should, pr let's, we could go ahead and read, um, uh, read the, the sort, like the main text that I'm working, like that I'm thinking of while I'm writing this piece, while I wrote this essay. Um, and I've just got like a physical copy here, uh, so I'll just be reading to y'all. Because again, it's like, texts are fragile and they disappear. It's, it's like the, like half, half of this text is like not even published usually, because it's notes. It's, it's notes about the poems rather than the poems themselves. The people just completely ignore it. It's like the notes often aren't published. And if they are published, they're not published next to the poems. Um, it's just like this specific edition published by the La Real Academia Española. An, an anthology of uh, Gabriela Mistral that has it published this way. And I was able to benefit from that greatly in my research and my writing, but it's like, that's super fret. It's like, it's just by chance that I happen to have this right edition that happens to publish it in a complete fashion. But yeah, so I'll read it first in Spanish. Um, I'll read the, I'll read the poems. I'll reach, it's like, it's got three chunks. I'll read each chunk in Spanish first and then I'll translate it. Um, it's going to be a live translation, so it might not be a very good translation. Uh, it's certainly not going to be poetic. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Also, is the music better, Greenstack? I, I turned it down while I was looking for the book. I saw your message. Is it better now, or should I still tweak it a little bit? Just before we start the reading, because I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to be competing with the music. Right now it's good, okay. I might even tweak it down, uh, I might even tweak it down a little bit too. A little bit more than I even had it. What song is it again? Oops, I'm back. How do you go away? Oh, that's weird. Oh yeah, yeah, This it's a long song. I chose this partially because it is super long. And it's really pretty, and I like it a lot, but, um... Oh, uh, you can actually go out... One moment. Let me sure, make sure I pass you guys a link so y'all can go and support it. It's a lovely song. Here we are. Make sure to go support that song. All right, mate, support the artist. I don't think they're active anymore, which is sad, but yeah. Make sure to give them a look, because they deserve it. Like, they do really good work. Um, but yeah, so. So we'll go ahead. Uh, if it sounds good, we're going to go ahead and start with the poems. And as, as so there are two poems and then some notes after the poems. The, the group is called the group. The group collectively is called Poemas de la Madre Más Triste, Poems of the Saddest Mother. Um, but each the two po it's two poems, each with their own title and then some prose, some untitled prose, um, explanatory prose. So you could even call the poems themselves prose. They're not soup to me. They're poetic, but not everybody. Uh, I've seen them described as prose. They're actually classified as prose in these uh, in this anthology rather than as poems. Uh, I think anyway. I think this is the pro section. Yeah, it is. Um, anyway, um, so the first one, so the first poem is Arrojada, which is ca like uh, kind of cast out. That's what that translates as. Um, and it goes this way. Mi padre dijo que me echaría, gritó a mi madre que me arrojaría esta misma noche. 
La noche es tibia a la claridad de las estrellas. Yo podría caminar hasta la aldea próxima, pero ¿y si nace en estas horas? Mis sollozos le han llamado tal vez. Tal vez quiera salir por ver mi cara. Y tiritaría bajo el aire crudo, aunque yo lo cubriera. Um, so that is the uh, first poem. And I just need to check one word to make sure I can translate that one correctly. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, for, so the first poem is translated so, roughly like this. Cast out. My father said that he would cast me out, yelled at my mother, and that he would throw me out that, that same night. The night is uh, lukewarm. Uh, uh, under the cl uh, clearness of the stars, I could walk perhaps to the next town over. But if he were, uh, but if he were born in these hours, my tears have called him. Perhaps, perhaps he wants to le uh, exit to leave my to see my face. I need shiver beneath cold, uh, crude air, even if I covered him. Um, uh, and then that's followed by Para que viniste, the second poem, which is, uh, what did you come for? Uh, and it goes this way. Para que viniste? Nadie te amará aunque eres hermoso, hijo mío. Aunque sonríes graciosamente como los demás niños, como el menor de mis hermanitos, no te besaré, sino yo, hijo mío. Y aunque tus manitas se agiten buscando juguetes, no tendrás para tus fuegos sino mi seno, la hebra de mis lágrimas, hijo mío. ¿Para qué viniste si el que te trajo te odió a sentirte en mi vientre? Pero no para mí viniste, para mí que estaba sola hasta cuando me oprimía entre sus brazos, hijo mío. Which, uh, which translated would be, Why did you come? Nobody will love you even if you're beautiful, my son. Even if you... you uh, and smile graciously like the other children, uh, like the least of my brother, little brothers. Only I will uh, kiss you, my little child. Um, and even if your little hands uh, are, uh, shake looking for toys, you will have uh, you will not have nothing for toys except for my chest and the hebra. I actually need to check that translation. Hebra. La hebra. The, the string, yeah. The strings and the, t or the threads, uh, the strands of my tears. My son, why did you come if he who brought you hated you in, uh, when he felt you in my, in my room? But no, for me you came, for me who was alone, even when, uh, uh, even when he uh, oppressed me within his arms, my son. So basically, the, the st they tell a story of uh, like it, it's a very brief story, two poems about a, like a single mother being cast out, um, uh, like cast out of her home for like uh, like on account of her pregnancy and like um, and, and in particular her mourning over the fact that people will not love her child um, as as he deserves to be loved. Um, um, and, and it's like and that's kind of like the climax is para mí viniste you came for me. It's like, even if no one else will love you, I will love you. Um, and it's like, you've come to, uh, and it's like, uh, I, and like, and with the excla exclamation, I was alone even when, like the father of the child, like, uh, like I was alone even when the father of the child held me in his arms. It's like, um, and you alone, the child makes her not alone. So um, that's, so those are the poems. But it's like, uh, the poems are interesting in and of themselves, but I'm especially interested in the note that she writes to defend this poem. Because there was, a, when she was going to publish this, there was actually, uh, she faced some opposition from certain commenters um, and some revised, uh, um, certain people opposed its, uh, the publication of, these, uh, of this story. So um, I'll read it in Spanish first, bit by bit, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a few paragraphs. Um, and this is, and it's actually this note that follows the poems where the phrase la vida total comes from. Um, so it starts, uh, Nota, una tarde paseando por una calle miserable de Temuco, vi a una mujer del pueblo sentada a la puerta de su rancho. Estaba próxima a la maternidad y su rostro revelaba una profunda amargura. Pasa, pasó delante de ella un hombre y le dijo una frase brutal que la hizo enrojecer. Yo sentí en ese momento toda la solidaridad del sexo y la infinita, infinita piedad de la mujer para la mujer y me alejé pensando, 
Es una de nosotras quien debe decir, ya que los hombres no lo han dicho, la santidad de este, este estado doloroso y divino. Si la misión del arte es embellecerlo todo, es una inmensa misericordia. ¿Y por qué no hemos purificado a los ojos de los impuros esto? Y escribí los poemas que proceden con intención casi religiosa. So that being translated is, one afternoon, passing for the, a miserable street in Temuco, I saw a, a, a woman from the, uh, from the pueblo, from the, from the village, or I, I don't know how big Temuco is, the pueblo. Um, sentar, uh, I saw a woman uh, seated at the door of her ranch, um, su rancho. And, uh, she was close to maternity, so she was heavily pregnant, and uh, her face revealed a profound bitterness. Um, a man passed in front of her and s said a brutal phrase um, that made her go red. Um, I felt in this moment all the solidarity of the sex, um, uh, the infinite mercy of a woman for a woman, and I left. And I went away thinking, uh, "It is one of us, nos, uh, es una de nosotros, nosotras. It is one of us, women. So uh, it's in the feminine. It is one of us, us being feminine, who should say." Now that the men have not said it, that the holy, the holiness of this painful and divine state, if the mission of art is to beautify everything, and is an immense miser, uh, is, an, is an immense mercy, uh, why have we not purified to the eyes of the impure this? And it, as this is italicized with reference to the state of pregnancy. Um, and I wrote these poems that proceed with an intention almost religious, uh, with almost religious intent. Um, so that's the that's the first part, and then uh, the end, the second half of the prose. Um, Algunas de esas mujeres que para ser castas necesitan cerrar los ojos sobre la realidad, cruel pero fatal, hicieron de estos poemas un comentario ruin que me entristeció por ellas mismas. Hasta me insinuaron que los eliminase de un libro. En esta obra egotista empequeñecida a mis propios ojos por ese egotismo, tales prosas humanas tal vez sean lo único en que se canta la vida total. ¿Había de eliminarlas? No. Aquí quedan dedicadas a las mujeres capaces de ver que la santidad de la vida comienza en la maternidad, la cual es por lo tanto sagrada. Sienten ellas la honda ternura con que una mujer que apacienta por la tierra los hijos ajenos irá a las madres todos los niños del mundo. Which translated is, um, Some of the women who, in order to be chaste, need to close their eyes about the, uh, about cruel but fatal reality, Made, uh, made ruinous uh, criticism of these poems, which which saddened me for their own sake, for their sake. They even insinuated that I should eliminate these poems from the book. Um, in this egotistical work, um, um, small to my own eyes, uh, on account of this egotism, um, the such um, human prose is perhaps the only thing in which sings uh, is sung la vida total um so i'll just reread that it's like um uh, the, such human prose is perhaps the only thing in which the wholeness of life is sung should i should i eliminate such no here they stay dedicated to the woman capable of th th seeing that the holiness of life commences in maternity which is uh therefore sacred may they feel the the deep tenderness with which a mother um, uh, that uh, pacienta does that translate it's like it's funny when you know the meaning of a word but you don't know how to translate it uh, yeah, um, may they feel the deep tenderness with which a mother who feeds um, by the earth uh, that, that feeds on the earth for uh, the children of others Looks on mothers, uh, looks on, uh, looks on the mothers of all the children of the world. So that's um, Gabriela Mistral um, is um, d just a little bit of off uh, description of her. She is, was a Chilean educator. She never married. She never had children, but wrote extensively about motherhood um, and was very um, interested in the theme. And that's kind of where La Vida Total comes from. Uh, or that's why that's kind of the motivation of that so that's just kind of the groundwork for um this text um which where i focus more on that concept of la vida total and like let's talk about these process process humanas these this human prose in which the wholeness of life is sung 
Because that, that phrase in particular fascinates me. Um, um, certainly, I would agree with Gabriel Mistral that the uh, poemas de la madre más triste, like the, these stories about um, motherhood, deeply sing of the wholeness of life. But I, it's like this is kind of uh, this essay is kind of like taking a, like kind of building off of that that start that starting spot. So, um, uh, vamos. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and read the. So it's like now that you know the text from which it comes. Hopefully the essay will be more meaningful. And I do describe the, the text somewhat in, in the essay, but it's like, you know, it, it's better to read the full thing and like know what, I, know what it's based off of. Um, and the other thing to mention is um, poly, polyphony. Uh, polyphony, uh, polyphony, it's just, it, it's what its roots mean. Poly, many, phony voices, so, uh, or phone, phony voices. But, um, Many voices. So poly uh, polyphony is a tendency in, uh, it's a trope or it's a mechanic in especially novels um, to invoke many voices, um, to give many voices uh, the chance to speak in a single text. Because um, oftentimes we get uh, texts that are very, that have singular voices. Like I, like the like there's one protagonist who narrates the whole thing and we only ever see things from their perspective. And honestly, if we're being honest, it's like the, the protagonist's perspective is pretty obviously even the author's perspective. So we're not even getting the author plus the protagonist's perspective. We're just getting the author's perspective. Um, polyphony is kind of like a, a, like a mechanic. It's kind of like pushing back against that by introducing more voices into a novel and allowing more voices to speak. Um, um, so this this is a literary analysis essay. So it's like it's it's kind of couched in terms of literary analysis. So if you have any questions, please just stop me. Um, just let me know. Um, so I can make because it's like um, there may be some more uh, theoretical components that I want to make sure that we can uh, all understand because it's like the, the theory is worthwhile and it's good. Um, I'm very fond of it. So um, so let's get into the essay. A description of La Vida Total. Um, this essay is an attempt to describe a certain framework of empathy and intellectual controversy. At the center of this piece is a short piece of prose by Gabriela Mistral, Poemas de la Madre Más Triste. La Vida Total, the name for this proposed framework, is a story of grief, of infinity, of joy, sight, and blindness. After covering the theoretical groundwork for La Vida Total, we will move to Mistral's work and how it generates a beautiful vision for literature in terms of praxis and implications. Um, and you can see some of that, like, already that opening prose. It's like, I'd write differently for different audience, but this was an academic audience, so we're a bit held back there. But anyway, section one, components. The concept of La Vida Total is not so much a novel con concept as it an extension of previous theories. Two concepts must be defined before La Vida Total can be properly described, Umwelt and Polyphony. The first is understood according to the theory of Umwelt by Jacques von Uyckskul, and the, theory, and the second by the theories of Bakhtin. We begin by discussing these terms and the relevant parts of their respective theories. An Umwelt, plural Umwelten, is an organism's unique sensory world. More complexly, Herman Weber defined it as the totality of conditions contained in an entire complex of surroundings which permit a certain organism, by virtue of its specific organization, to survive. Wexkill principally contrasted Umwelten on the level of species. Are the perceived world of the jellyfish is distinct from a human's, a worm's, a moss's, or a salamander's? Uh, many species lack sensory tools humans possess, like eyes, ears, and noses, but certain species possess senses humans do not, like some equalities abilities to sense an electric charge. The Umwelt can only be constructed from sensory information. What exists outside of the senses cannot exist within the Umwelt. Species is only one of the many ways by which Umwelten become differentiated. In the human case, all sorts of subjective experience alter a person's Umwelt. Nation, culture, family, religion, profession, education, class, illness, genetics. As a person with PTSD perceives the world differently on account of prior sensations of trauma, their entire world, their Umwelt, is changed according to the changes in perception. However, Umwelten are not a deterministic model. Nobody is the product of their milieu. Each is the master of his own Umwelt. I'm quoting, uh, that's from Uxkil. Uh, an Umwelt does not determine the choices of its singular inhabitant. An Umwelt changes the, uh, changes the choices its inhabitant can make. Not the least of these are the decisions a person makes in integrating subjective information into a coherent worldview. Uh, the decisions that go into the creation of, of Umwelten. We now turn to polyphony, the manliness of voices. The concept is first relevant in its typical literary sense. The ethereal inclusion of many voices within a novel, including voices conflicting with the authors, on a more or less equal footing. Polyphony in terms of Umwelten is allowing multiple Umwelten to become visible to the reader. 
For the purposes of this essay, the concept of polyphony will be stretched a bit far. That polyphony, as used here, does not conform to its usual meaning. It, to its usual meaning is acknowledged. La Vida Total is not only concerned with the confluence of voices within a novel, intertextual, but across works, which is intertextual. On reading an author's over, there is polyphony. The many mood selves and beliefs the author inhabited across their working period produce different voices, voices which typically will not sum to a complete concept of the author. Borges reflected later in life, I suppose my best work is over. And yet, do I, I, and yet I do not feel I've written myself out. I no longer regard happiness as unattainable. Once long ago, I did. What his most study, studied stories often seem to communicate that belief in an unattain, unattainable happiness. Yet that belief represented a Borges that existed for a certain period of time and later ceased to be. A poly per, polyphonic perspective listens to both Borges. One more process of polyphonizing is required. A vida total requires polyphony to act across every text and every authorship. Everything that any human ever has, could, or will write is here viewed as a single infinite text. The human text. The human text contains endless, unknown, and unknowable voices. Each voice inhabits a unique umwelt, an umwelt to which it will never share with anyone else. Never, nonetheless, this multitude of voices can form a single text. La vida total is concerned with reading that text. Umwelten is la vida, polyphony is the, to uh, the totality, which combined produce la vida total. Section 2. Uh, before we get to the second section, any questions quick about uh, umwelten or polyphony? Um, since those are those are kind of like the foundational concepts for uh, this subject. I'll just wait for about uh, 30 seconds or so. Um, just for a minute. I don't want to proceed if there are open questions about that. Because that's the theoretical basis for uh, the rest of the essay. Which we're barely through. Oh, we're barely, it's like if you look at the scroll bar. Oh, you can't see the scroll bar. Uh, we're not. We're not very far. If you do have any questions, go ahead and still uh, feel free to leave them in chat. But I think I will go ahead and transition into the second section, La Vida Total. What then is La Vida Total? La Vida Total is to expand one's umwelt to include as many umwelten as possible and live accordingly. It is an attempt to live and understand as many lives as possible within the constraints of a single life. La Vida Total is in large part a literary task. It is obsessed with the human text. It goes without saying that reading the full human text is impossible, unless the reader possesses, an, at minimum, an infinite amount of time. Many of its parts are irreversibly lost, just as many of its parts will never be written. Many authors exist in pure potentiality, prevented from ever exhibiting the mind. How many texts are unwritten solely because the author was illiterate and impoverished, without the resources of text creation? All these, although these texts cannot be read, they exist, and therefore enter the human text. It is written by everyone constantly. It contains everyone's stories, every dead man's untold tales. Olmec farmers, Sumerian accountants, Jainist mathematicians, Norte Chico ar architects, Kentucky gas station clerks, Taiwanese school children. All their contributions are co-equal components. La Vida Total is instead the incomplete reading of the human text. It is a finite contemplation of an infinite literary object. Many things are hidden in the infinities of the human text. The human text is a timeless, spaceless, unchanging text composed of the deeply spatial and temporal envelopment. It encompasses humanity's past and future, but also alternative histories that exist purely as potentials. The world's a fiction too figure in the human text. Fiction's polyphonic characters may correspond to real human attributes combined in an entirely possible fashion within a fictional body, unreal only in the sense that no human has yet been born with that specific expression or combination of attributes. If not, they correspond to flaws in the author's beliefs about humanities, flaws which must be accounted for in the total concept of humanity. It seems reasonable to call whatever worldview or beliefs that result from comprehending the human text capital T truth. The La Vida Total is also a search for truth. La Vida Total is a constant, constant accumulation of incoherent, apparently contradictory data and narratives, filtered internally through the reader's own sensory devices. So this is the final key aspect. Uh, harmony. Just as the reading of the human text will always be complete, so will the interpretation and reconciliation of all that has been read. On some level, every umwelt belongs to the same world, produced by the same laws dictated by the character of this universe and its human subjects. 
This common genesis guarantees all these disparate Umwelten subjectivities and expressions can be reconciled in polyphony. polyphony. Impossibility and paradox are recurring themes in La Vida Total. After all, the very definition of an Umwelt precludes understanding even one Umwelt outside of one's own. With respect to reading, interpretation, harmonization, and finally application of all that has been learned, each is an infinite task alone and an infinite task combined. There should be no pretense that living La Vida, ta La Vida Total is terminable. Instead, it is the belief that it is better to go as far as one can down this path of reading, learning, and growing, despite the fact that the end will never come. 3. An Art Text for La Vida Toda Poemas de la Madre Más Triste Poemas de la Mat Madre Más Triste by Gabriela Mistral is an essential expression of this framework. It is a pair of prose poems followed by a brief explanatory note. The phrase itself, La Vida Total, is taken from the explanatory note. Tales prosas humanas tal vez en lo único en que se canta la vida total, or such human prose is perhaps the only, uh, the only thing in which uh, the totality of life is sung, or the la vida total is sung. Gabriela Mistral escribió los poemas con intención casi religiosa. After uh, Gabriela Mistral wrote these poems with an almost religious intent, after witnessing a pregnant woman be brutally insulted by a man passing by the woman's ranch. The first poem, Arrojada, deals with a pregnant woman being cast out of her home and abandoned by her family and mother. The second, Para que viniste, is the woman's soliloquy directed at her child in which she laments how the child would be unloved by all but her, yet the child came to be in order to comfort her. The act of co-suffering that prompted her to write these poems was, from the beginning, an expression of the vida total. She states her purpose as beautifying motherhood, a state she never possessed, being childless her whole life. Yet her poetry is that of a mother. She lives another life vicariously through her poetry. Poemas de la Madre Más Triste is about the umwelten of single mothers in their full complexity, the stress of abandonment and loneliness, the difficulties of motherhood, and the unexpected sorrow and desire are assuaged, not by a, but are assuaged but not erased by the unconditioned love between mother and child. Gabriela acknowledges the great power of love, but does not shrink from the despair and isolation that sometimes accompany maternity. La Vida Total, as exemplified in these poems, wrestles with the opposing forces and perspectives that occur, ju not just outside the individual but within. Oppositions are allowed to coexist, not in peace per se, but without the demand that either side cease to be. This is hardly unique to poems de, la ma de las Madres Matrices in Mistral's work. As Alegria observes, her work is composed of professional confessions, human documents instead of literary exercises. He describes her poetry as a voice too strong for the little songs that it wishes to sing. The movement is always there, a powerful, vast, rhythmic upsurge that encompasses people, landscapes, passions, hopes, bitterness, faith. Mis Mistral dives deep into her own life and lays it bare in her production of poetry. The intensity of emotion which adds such force to many of Gabriela Mistral's poems, giving them the appearance of being wrung from the very depths of the poetess's soul. Mistral understood how La Vida Total is a deep dive, not just into the souls of others, but into the umwelt of oneself. In accordance with the polyphonic spirit, the phrase La Vida Total is not exclusive to Mistral. José Martú too invoked it. En la vida total han de ajustarse con gozo los elementos con que en la porción actual de vida que atravesamos parecen desunidos y hostiles, which translated would be, in la vida total or in the whole totality of life, um, uh, it is necessary to adjust with joy the elements that in their current portion of life, uh, th that in the current portion of life that we uh, traverse seem un disunited and hostile, ununited and hostile. So. Um, it's not a very good translation, but uh, and basically Marti saying it's like in the Vida, in La Vida Total you have to um, adjust with joy um, uh, many parts of life that at least to our current within our current perspective and as we understand them as and as they appear to us in our current current and limited lives we have to take these. Un, uh, disunited and often hostile elements of life um, and ideas and truth and um, adjust them with with joy and um, um, and help them square. Hoskova, I can't pronounce that. I don't know if that's a Spanish name. If that's a Spanish name, that's Oskova, but that doesn't look like a Spanish name. Uh, uh, Hoskova elaborates on Marti's connection into La Vida Total. In the Concepcion de José Martí, la armonía y la belleza surge por unión de lo contradictorio, abarca angustia, tensión, espanto del mundo, en otro polo de la armonía tiene dimensión cósmica y dimensión íntima, unida con la ternura y la nostalgia por la infancia, which uh, it's translated as, in the conception, in the con uh, according to the 
In Jose Marti's mind, harmony and beauty arise from the union of the contradictory. Uh, it contains uh, anguish, tension, um, s being startled by the world, being afraid of the world. Uh, but on another pole of harmony, you have the cosmic dimension and intimate dimension, united with tenderness and nostalgia for infancy. Mistral and Marti elaborate a vision of compassion and tenderness that makes the intellectual and emotional complexity of La Vida Total survivable. Uh, and this kind of leads us to a praxis section, or a practical section. Because almost every step of the process is infinite or otherwise impossible, La Vida Total must use methods of approximation. The work of authors such as Gabriela Mistral is essential to La Vida Total. La Vida Total would be impossible without them. Authors perform the work of approximation simply by adding to the body of writing, the more sophisticated lead through techniques like polyphony and soul exploration. The study of their own senses, perspectives, and emotions, the world as they can perceive it. Each additional entry provides another finite piece to incorporate into the infinite text, thus bringing the infinite collection of readable texts closer to the infinite. Beyond authorship, the matter of interpretation requires significant discussion of its own. Unlike infinity or infinity day approximating texts like Borges' Book of Sand or Library of Babel, the human text is fully interpretable. For most of its pages, when one begins to read, they will, within a certain degree of error, understand the text. Although the human text spans all time and times and languages, it also includes all translations necessary for readers in any language to partake. Translation increases the error range of interpretation, but typically will not make the error level into error. Error is the key concern when approximating infinity with finitude. Oftentimes, it is impossible to know how severe the error has become. However, there is a mathematical guarantee to ensure the finite reader's perspective approaches the infinite vida total over time. If the reader's perspective always trends towards expansion, as long as the knowledge gain exceeds the error growth, and there is no limit on the knowledge gain, then the perspective will approach infinite comprehension with all guarantee. This is a literary application of the monotone convergence theorem, the proper discussion of which is beyond the scope of this essay. See back. In short, the two conditions are that the reader. Um, are that the reader requires more truth than error, and that the reader is willing to take on all truth eventually. It could also be thought of constantly growing one's been developed, never letting anything remain outside it, an ever-growing bubble of perception. Given an infinite amount of time, such a perspective will become infinite, that is to say, it will comprehend la vida total. The first condition, ensuring knowledge gain overall exceeds knowledge loss or error, is difficult. From a finite perspective, locked within our own belt, and it is impossible to truly know. Thomas Bernhard's observer observations on truth from the author's perspective can be inverted for the reader's sake. Truth, it seems to me, is known only to the person who is affected by it, and if he chooses to communicate to others, he automatically becomes a liar. Uh, whatever is communicated can only be falsehood and falsification, hence it is only falsehoods and falsifications that are communicated. What matters is whether we want to lie or to tell and write the truth, even though it can never be the truth and never is the truth. I really like that quote. The reader cannot even be sure that the author intends to write the truth. However, Bernhard's argument provides a decanter for separating texts valuable to the seeker of la vida total from those that are not. Texts that seek to tell the truth, and especially those that acknowledge their inability to capture the truth, are elevated. Texts that are unconcerned with truth are de-emphasized. Texts that exploit, dehumanize, or devalue their subjects are condemned. As Levito Total is concerned with Umwelten, such texts can only be studied to comprehend the darkened Umwelt of the author because exploitation, dehumanization, and devaluation of others cuts the reader off from the subject's Umwelten, preventing polyphony and contemplation of Levito Total. By the same token, texts that emphasize kindness, sensitivity, and mutual understanding often, but not necessarily, serve Levito Total better than texts that do not. One more thing must be said respecting texts lacking value for Levito Total. Even though some voices must be rejected in their literal or umweltenless interpretation, and even if certain actions must be condemned unilaterally, part of La Vida Total is still acknowledging the umwelten that produced these voices and actions. It is often required of the reader to reject the belief or action expressed, but understand why that belief or action came to be. The second condition, avoiding limits on knowledge, is not so troublesome, and learned will largely be achieved by enjoying all good texts. La Vida Total is not a framework concerned with canonicity or short-term short-term cohesion. La Vida Total requires macro and macro narratives, modernism, postmodernism, paradox, multiculturalism, literary revival, and the enfranchisement of diverse perspectives. The old canons cannot produce La Vida Total in their centering within specific historical cultural moments. New canons can do no better. Simply establishing a canon of integrated diverse authors and cultures quickly fall behind the growth of literature. 
to say nothing of how any canon will necessarily exclude works regardless of source and may benefit the particular reader in their own belt more than the canonical text. A reader should not cut themselves off from the broad domains of human experience, religion, science, literature. Each offers human testimony. This is also true of media and moods. La vida that thou cannot be found solely through serious philosophy or contemplation. Silly, preposterous, and casual works all form an essential and beautiful part of the human text. As somewhat embarrassing but useful, as a somewhat embarrassing but useful demonstration of this principle, this author, essay's author cried to the Swedish pop song Carol Maldanson because of its slime, the sublime demonstration of this point. Silly media is not the end of the unconventional in La Vida Total. Sometimes, knowing preposterous interpretation can be profound, knowingly preposterous interpretation can be profoundly valuable. Borges highlighted this in Kafka y sus precursores, or Kafka and his precursors. The essay aptly begins with one of Zeno's paradoxes in motion, which, like La Vida Total, are resolved by infinite methods. Highlighting a number of Kafkaesque texts that predate Kafka, Borges observes, Si no me equivoco, las heterogéneas piezas que, me, que he enumerado se parecen a Kafka. Si no me equivoco, no todas se parecen entre sí. Este último hecho es el más significativo. En cada uno de esos textos está la idi idiosincrasia de Kafka, pero si Kafka no hubiera escrito, no la percibiríamos. El hecho es que cada escritor crea a sus precursores. Su labor modifica nuestra concepción del pasado como ha de modificar el futuro. Or translated, if I'm not wrong, the heterogeneous p uh, pieces that I have enumerated all uh, all resemble Kafka. And if I'm not wrong, not all of them appear, uh, resemble each other. This last fact is the most significant. In every one of these texts, there's the idiosyncra there's Kafka's idiosyncrasy. But if Kafka had not written, we would not perceive that idiosyncrasy in common. Uh, this fact is the, the fact is that every writer creates his, uh, their precursors. Their labor modifies our conception of the past, just as it ought to, just as it must modify the future. Um, and that this is um, a reference to uh, the essay Kafka y sus precursores, where Borges is, in slightly more detail, is discussing how um, texts written before Kafka take on a Kafkaesque quality after Kafkaesque write. So even though somebody could write before Kafka wrote. Um, the fact that Kafka wrote causes you to reinterpret and change how you view texts written before Kafka. And you see how those texts led into Kafka and created Kafka. Um, but if Kafka had never written, you would never see that connection. You would not realize that all these texts were converging on Kafka. That Kafka was the sum and like the natural result of these many different texts with many different trends that do not necessarily resemble each other. But once Kafka exists, you see how they were unified and how these many texts come together and were related. It is preposterous, so just returning to the essay, it is preposterous to read a text predating Kafka as being Kafkaesque, and yet doing so can produce incredible textual and philosophical insight. Similarly, there are many occasions in which using a knowingly mismatched interpretive frame can be a valuable exercise. So long as the reader readily acknowledges that they are not interpreting the author or even the text, but their own modification. I would, uh, in addition to the variety of texts, the reader should understand that a large part of the Vida Total is acknowledging the valid validity of enemy or opposing beliefs in Umfelten. Every reader is insufficient on their own, just as is every author. There is a certain requirement of humility. If the reader mistakenly adopts an erroneous belief during the search for La Vida Total, that erroneous belief will limit their growth and keep them from La Vida Total until it is corrected. This happens constantly and inevitably. Every human needs to go through that correction process. In addition to these chiefly literary me methods for pursuing la vida total, there exists a glorious abundance of other practices that expand one's umwelt. Of these, we highlight the neologism Sonder, coined by the Dictionary of Absurd Sorrows. Uh, Sonder is defined as the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid, vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill sprawling deep underground, elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, which you might appear only once, as an extra sipping coffee in the back room, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. La Vida Total is about exploration, discovery, and the beauty of diversity. Thus, its practice is accessible to people of many philosophies, religion, disciplines, and walks of life. A practitioner cannot do it all, like so many other parts of La Vida Total. Diversifying the methods and disciplines employed for the expansion of Velton should prove fruitful. And finally, the conclusion. Unsurprisingly, the discussion of La Vida Total cannot be completed 
Like any stopping point in an infinite process, what is included and what is exclu excluded is a matter of practicality. However, some, com final com some final comments should be valuable. La Vida Total is an aesthetic of beauty built from human difference and conflict. Interest in La Vida Total is often attached to suffering. Gabriela Mistral employed La Vida Total against the dehumanization of mothers in Poemas de la Madre Más Triste. Work elsewhere represents a struggle with powerful internal pain and troubling outside forces. Red Mark identifies each of Poema del Hijo, Me Siendo, El Niño Solo, Poemas de la Madre Más Triste, and Poemas de las Madres. Ah, uh, that's a typo. Um, in Poemas de la Madre Más Triste, as possible as progressions for a struggle with childlessness. Jose Martí died a martyr in order um, not to die of illness in Cuba's war for independence, or that ultimately subjugated Cuba to other foreign powers and set the foundation for the Castro dictatorship. This essay's author has turned to La Vida Total in response to the study of the true nature of genocide and the despair that comes with him being unable to save or support anyone involved, mad from their madness, the victim from the cat. An objective model of reality cannot be correct unless it fully explains every subjective reality, every envelop. Uh, enough and Velton are pierced through with profound bitterness, pain, and suffering. The innocent, carefree child is part of it, so is the child soldier. La Vida Total subjects its devil to you to contemplation of pure pain and evil, which must be reconciled with the purest love and joy, as an attempt to deal with the world as it is and seem truly understand what to make of life. And the end. Um, there's the uh, citations. Um, I'll just pass. Honestly, a lot of this is a good reminder for me. <laughs> it's like I don't remember every I don't remember a lot of what I wrote here. There's a lot of stuff that was just like a refreshing reminder or like really nice. Um, like this quote, truth is truth it seems to me is known only to the person who's affected by it. If he chooses to communicate it to others, he automatically becomes a liar. Whatever is communicated can only be falsehood and falsification, and so it is only falsehoods and falsifications that are communicated. What matters is whether we want to lie or to tell and write the truth, even though it can never be the truth and never is the truth. That's a really good one. Um, that's it. Um, and then remembering, I forgot that Jose Martí actually wrote about, like, he, like used the phrase Levita Total. It's a rare phrase. Um, it's like, those are, I think, the only two that I've found in literature are um, are from Gabriela Mistral and Martí. There may be more. I'd love to find more. I mean, if, and if anyone knows them, I'd be more than interested. But it's like, uh, yeah, this was, it was a good, re it's a good experience uh, for me to reread it. But uh, do you get, does anybody have any questions, doubts, curiosities that they'd like me to uh, address? Um, anything you guys would like to know? This should be tied with the window. No, I think I used Lovey to bow for her. Yeah, this essay is really important to me, and this is basically an explanation of how I take And I apologize that it is highly academic, which makes it somewhat less accessible than I would like it to. Um, but at the same time, it's all there's also a richness. It's like the depths of what I'm trying to describe here, and like the richness of it, is hard to describe without that academia, without that theory. Um, because the theory, it, it's like, it's motivated by theory, and it's like that theory is kind of like where a lot of that substance comes from. So it's like, I could cut that theory out, but you would have an inferior it, it, uh, you would not necessarily, it's like, you'd have a very different product. And it would have virtue, but it would not have a lot of the virtue that this particular essay has. And I guess is a good way to put it. And it would take a lot of work. Like, this is uh, 10 or 20 pages, I forget. I think it's a 10 pager. But, um, um, how long is it? Hunting, citations, it is. 15 pages. But yeah, um, this, this essay is a lot to me. I got a 100% on it. <laughs> uh, my professor was really nice me about like uh it's like one of the nicest comments i've like probably the nicest comment i've ever received on like any um on any essay <laughs> uh was the response to this but um i don't even remember writing this essay per se and this is actually like i feel like smarter than something i'd write right now um <laughs> i think this is better than something i'd write right now 
um, for, to be frank. Oh, cool! It was like, it's actually my math professor. It's like I cited Backer for the monotone convergence, the monotone convergence theorem, and it's like I was able to find one of it's like there's just like a lecture that he posted online. Oh, my one of my math professors. That's fun. He was the one I learned uh, analysis from. Mathematical analysis. Analysis means calculus when a mathematician says it. Most of the time. Not always. Mathematician, right? Mathematicians are all about precision of language, but then we reuse words, like, a lot. And then you have to, like, clarify. It's like, I'm using this sense of the word right now, not that sense. And blah, blah, blah. And meh, meh, meh. And... Yeah, the proofs of calculus are difficult. It's like, I agree to appreciate them. And I wish I weren't sick. I really wish I hadn't been sick the second time around. Like, uh, when... Uh, yeah. Analysis is a... Analysis is very difficult. Um, it's very important. But it's also worth noting that, like, you learn... It's like you learn the proofs of calculus in, like, a semester or two. Um, at a professional level. Uh, like, at a... Like, in a rigorous mathematical fashion. But, uh... It's like it took 200 years to, to create those proofs. They didn't come out of nowhere. Um, yeah, um, so before we wrap up, I might just like cover like just like if you're oh, if you are interested in some of my other essays, some of them are Spanish, some of them are English. Um, I really like literary theory, but I really don't like literature sometimes. It's like I'm really interested in the best of texts. But I'm really not interested in mediocre texts, and I think that's something that I've I was very frustrated with as a student. But also just like my health, my health wasn't good, and that it's like, honestly, this almost made me this made me want to like go back into the Spanish literature major, uh, master's degree program. Maybe and maybe I do that after I finish my law degree. It's like I'm tempted to do that. Uh, whether that's wise or not, who can say? Um. But, uh, because it's like, I produce, I actually like what I wrote during that period. Um, because it's like, in 2019, I published my thesis on the persecution of Salvadoran people, which I talked about at the beginning of the stream. Um, but, like, uh, during my first semester, I had, my three term papers were, um, one was on moral distress, which is, like, how, um, you actually, you, you can actually, like, not being allowed to act according to your conscience, especially when people are being harmed, by your inability it's like when you know people are being harmed and you want to help and you can't help um often due to systemic um systemic cost obstacles or things like that um you actually you can actually experience like trauma like eff uh, trauma like effects um this one is moral distress a systemic issue in l2 and second language teaching i had to specifically i, I just wanted to write about moral distress in teaching generally but i had to specify for, like spanish teaching so that was like it's a Spanish literature major, or a degree, so it's like I had to limit it to Spanish language. Um, but yeah, it's like, I think it's a, it's really something that we need to understand better in society is just like how, like not letting people do what they feel is right and not giving them the tools necessary is really dangerous. I mean, it can be really ruinous to people. Because it's like, especially like teacher, it's like teachers who don't have the resources to help their students. Like even when they know their students are in like really bad home, like in like not great homes or like at, outright bad homes in many cases. Uh, but they, like many teachers, just don't have any way to really meaningfully help or reliably help. Um, so that can be a really big issue. Um, and and it's like, it basically causes teachers to absorb trauma. Um, absorb the trauma, the trauma of their students and, so, and experience severe distress. And then uh, human rights advocacy and synthesis, viewing power and foulness and powerlessness. So this is basically like, that essay is about how difficult it is to write about foul subject matter. Because it's like, when you're genuinely writing about human rights issues, it's like it's traumatizing for you as an author, and it's traumatizing for the, it can be traumatizing for the reader. Readers exposed to things that they really don't want to know, um, that are painful to contemplate. Um, like the mere contemplate, it's like when you talk about genuine human rights violations, it's like the mere contemplation of the human rights violation is actually painful. Um, in the first world, oftentimes we. Uh, like we talk, it's like there's a lot of accusations about what is and is not a human right violation, but it's like, uh, it's like the gen, it's like the big stuff, like the stuff that really, really needs to change. It's like it is painful merely to contemplate, to be merely like mere awareness causes harm of some of these issues, which makes it very difficult to write about, to advocate, to convince people to look 
because it's like it, it, to change and improve human rights situations you have to get people to look at things um to perceive things and which is a very difficult thing to do when you know that what they're looking at is painful and that you are inflicting pain on people merely by telling them the truth um by making them aware of things and so that's a very difficult process i mean that's kind of what this e this essay human rights advocacy and incense in insensitivity is about um And then, because uh, uh, yeah, it's really difficult to get people to look. And it's like, I actually think that's, uh, especially since free speech is relatively common in the modern sphere. Um, I actually, I, I think, uh, I think, um, like, I think cruelty is actually one of the countermeasures against free speech. Because it's like, free speech has a tendency to combat dictatorship and cruelty. Um, but if you can make it, if you make something so cruel or so miserable to describe that people are not willing to talk about it, that's how you perpetuate human rights violations. That's a way to resist the effects of free speech. You just make something so awful that people aren't willing to talk about it. And if people aren't willing to talk about it, then free speech doesn't combat the cruelty um, because people have to talk about it. So that's kind of, and that's also why I've been like, I've struggled a lot with like not being willing to talk about things I hate, like even things I hate, like, poli like politics. It's like, because um, it's like not talking about politics doesn't make them better. And it's like, in, and in fact, it allows things to get worse, and it allows cruelty to grow. Um, by, uh, and it's like, it's almost the point. It's like you make something worse, and people will be afraid to recount or tell or talk about what you've done. So it, it's like it's a way to. So it's like, and that make puts us in a position who are opposed to that kind of thing. Like we want the world to be better. Um, it makes it very. It's like, if you want to respect. It's like it means you have to use the freedom of speech to inflict harm by making people aware of things. Are miserable, um, which is really distressful, which is distressing and difficult. Also, hi, Rosamine. Uh, good to see you. I uh, hope you all are doing all right. We're just finishing up uh, essays. So, and then a uh, description of the Via Letal is what we just read. Um, so, watch the VOD if you want to know about that one. I love it. It's like, I, that's a probably, um, it's a very important essay. Um, and then, um, then uh, my second, then, I didn't even put one of the essays I wrote for the second semester here because it was just like, my second semester of Spanish literature, it's like, it was just like, it didn't produce anything. There was no up, like, there was no, it, it produced very little passion. And some of that definitely has to do with illness. Um, like the illness I was experiencing, um, like frankly, it's like, it's like, I couldn't focus in my classes as well as I wanted to. So that doesn't help. That doesn't help at all. Um, and it's like this, this essay, I actually, like my professor, professor actually had to like insist I take more, it's like insist I not force myself to write it. He gave me like almost like two weeks of extension to write this, like, and at his insistence, my health was so bad. And like my mood, like my mental was just like, like I was a wreck at this point. Um, and, and it's like, and that's just a lot of it is just like, I'm sick and I have a hard time keeping up with life. Um, but yeah, because it's like, I didn't want, it's like, because I have a hard time, it's like, I, I have a hard time asking for that because it's like professors are scary and dangerous and half of them are disrespectful uh, if you seek accommodations. It's like, if you seek accommodations from a professor, if a professor like encourages you to take accommodations, go take them, do it. Because it's like, it's so much easier for them to, it's like, if they offer you accommodations, you know you're in like in the green. If you have to ask them for accommodations, that's the day. That's what's terrifying, because it's like, you because it's like if a professor is willing to like acknowledge like your needs, great, great. But if they're not, asking them isn't going to change. And that and that's the hard thing. It's a really hard thing. And it's like I kind of hate the. It's like I love my good professors, but my bad. It's like bad professors are just like they literally ruin your life. <laughs> and it's like. It's like you want to beat them over. I I don't know. You you just want. I don't want to beat. I, that was just like me talking. It's like I just want them to like, not. Tea. But, or not. It's like it's like or even that. Just like, I just want them to like have some dang compassion. And not like abuse you as a student. Anyway. Um, but yeah. So but yeah. I actually produced three essays. The third one isn't here, because I didn't like it. <laughs> well, and it was also an analysis for like a mediocre Chilean film or something. It's like, it was a good film, and then the ending was awful. <laughs> uh, 
but uh but yeah also i kind of like that professor drove me insane because it's like we had arguments about magical realism and what is and is not magical real it's like if it's like if the characters are going to claim that they're winning musical duels with the help of the devil i think that's magical realism it's like if the devil is enchanting musical duels and like enchanting a flute to get or like or, or it was an accordion it's like if, if the devil is enchanting an accordion to make it like to make you win every duel you did every musical duel you you enter then that's magical realism okay that's magic <laughs> it's not necessarily magical realism but this specific text but this specific film was magical so it's like it's it's at least magical and that specific film was magical realism because it's like oh my gosh i don't know it's like some professors are really obnoxious <laughs> they're really i oh my gosh um, but, uh, so the uh, two essays that are actually here, um, let's talk about them. So, con amor al noir, una teoría de empatía literaria. So, so, so both of these essays are only available in Spanish. Like, uh, translating them would be a pain in the neck. Um, but I could if you really, 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 really wanted to. Um, so, con amor al noir is basically, it's basically like trying to reconcile noir with, uh, like, argue that good noir, because there's, like, good and bad noir. Like the, the noir that's really worthwhile is basically kind of like in the la vida total kind of thing. It's like um, noir, like really good noir is about like encouraging empathy and like allowing and like opening up perspective. Um, not just like trashy, like evil protagonists killing people and being bad. That's kind of, that's kind of not fiction. Um, and then this essay I actually think is really cool. Um, la locura sana y la violencia enfermiza. Con hijote como hombre más violento que loco. Um, that, that title is, um, uh, Healthy Sanity and, uh, Sickly Violence. Don Quixote as a man more violent than insane. Because Don Quixote is famously, it's like everybody knows Don Quixote for his insanity. Um, and that's kind of like a, where most people interpret Don Quixote. Um, but, um, Don Quixote, it's like my argument is basically, it's not so much that he's, in, what happens in Don Quixote isn't so much that he's insane, it's that he's radicalized. And that's specific. It's like he has a mental illness, pretty obviously, but his mental illness is appropriated and taken and exploited by radical factions. And that's basic. And my argument is basically like, and that's kind of like it can, like it has a lot to do with like modern um, depictions of mental illness because it's like there's a lot of tendency to depict mental illness as um, violent, um, but it's not. And that I go into it. And it's like the general violence rate in the human population is about one percent. The, the, uh, if you take, like, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder alone, which are considered some of the more violent, like, they're generally associated with violence, the violence rate of people with, uh, bi bipolar disorder or schizophrenia is only about, um, it's like 2%. It's like here, it's like about 4% of all societal violence seems to be a result of mental illness. Um, like 4% of all violence. What's really going on is, like, uh, radicalization both of mentally ill and non-mentally ill people um, like if we look at violent events in the United States or in the world it's like it's not mental illness is not what's going on it's radicalization it's people being convinced that violence is okay um, and it's like I go into um, so and I specifically do like an analysis of like chivalric literature like chivalric literature is full of radicalization it, it, it's trying to radicalize its uh, readers um, and it's like, and you actually get people today in 2022 who read chivalric literature and become radicalized. Because that's the purpose of chivalric literature, it's to produce violence. And it was a specific kind of violence to, uh, like, to correspond to specific societal needs of, like, uh, chivalric medieval societies. But it's still violence, and it's completely out of place in uh, the modern world. Um, uh, uh. Uh, and it's like I take th this is like a Facebook post from uh, like that was like discovered by like anti-extremism researchers. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, here's an English quote. Um, chivalry. That's the fun thing about writing it. Like doing a span. It's a a Spanish degree in the United States is that you're allowed to use both English and Spanish in your essays. Um, chivalric literature reinforced and without translating so it's like chivalric literature reinforced patterns of conduct the proper structure of society restraint and obeisance exercising and recognizing authority muscularity moral and literal when to stand and when to bend 
In order that the honorable enterprises, noble adventures, and deeds of arms which took place during the wars waged by France and England could be fittingly related and preserved for prosperity, so that brave men should be inspired thereby to follow such examples, I wish to place on record these matters for granted. So that's that's just a quote from uh, medieval chronolis, uh, chronicler. Um, uh, like basically, it's like chivalry was designed to produce more, uh, produce more chivalric soldiers. So it's like, um, it's like, and there were good parts. It's like that's something I mentioned. It's like chivalry signified knights fighting and the ideas that encouraged them to be more than trained thugs. But it's again, it's like especially when you get people reading. Uh, chivalric literature outside of the medieval epic. It's like by by the time of Don Quixote, Don Quixote is already post um, Don Quixote is already post uh, chivalric era. Um, the chivalric era had already died by the time uh, Quixote came around. It's like using chival chivalric literature outside of its pro it, its narrow context, and even then, is radicalized. Um, um, so it, it but yeah. So basically, like the point is is it's like Don Quixote is not a is a madman. But he, it's like insanity is not what produces his bizarre acts. Um, it, it's in, sp in particular his violence. Because Don Quixote is a very violent man throughout the text. Um, it's not. It, it's his It's the violence and the radicalization and the and him being convinced that there is that he is in a situation where violence is justified. That is what produces violence, not his insanity. And that um, insanity is a scapegoat um for uh, for the violence so it's like if you study don quixote as a violent person yeah and that's also that also like fits better into how don quixote ends don quixote renounces um like renounces um his adventures and his deathbed and it's like and it's because he's realized that he's just been violent it's, he doesn't blame it on insanity he doesn't blame it on anything he's i've been off it's like i've been out of control um uh, uh, and it's like, and it's his realization that he has been radicalized that uh, really, uh, that's what makes, that, it's like, people often, it's like, it's, it's like, there's, there's these little texts that like, often appear at the end of, yeah, it, it's like, that, that's probably Congress. But yeah, it's like, um, like texts like Don Quixote often have a moment where like the protagonist has done all kinds of crazy things and then suddenly starts acting normal. Um, and those have been pretty heavily criticized by some authors, but it's like, I think there's a lot of value to them. Just reminding the reader, like, first off that this is fiction and also just like, like, like encouraging people to not go insane. I think that's good. Um, to not think, oh, it's, it'd be so funny and quirky to do what Don Quixote did. It's like, that's not, no, it's like, um, Cervantes is very clear. Do not be Quixote. It's like, it's not funny to be Quixote. Um, it's not good. Um, you will be taken advantage of, you will take it, you will hurt people, things like that. Um, and I think that's very valuable. And it's like, it's also like, I think that moment makes more sense when you consider that Don Quixote has been radicalized rather than just being someone who's completely off their rocker. Um, but yeah, this was actually a really fun essay to write. Um, like academic, like it was academically interesting because it's like I got to like research mental illness, writing about mental illness and perceptions of mental illness, perceptions of violence, and specifically radicalizing rhetoric. Um, rhetoric of terrorism, which I didn't go too deep into that because it's like, I mean, who wants to be on an FBI watch list? Um, and it's also like that wasn't necessarily the most important function. I was more researching um, violent literature in the chivalric period um, rather than in the modern period. But it was like, it's like there was overlap and it's like I got to read some researchers talking about how the radicalization process occurs. That was just a fast, that's fascinating. And it's like, it's much more serious. It's like, it's something we do need to take more seriously. Um, so... Oh yeah, I actually talked about this essay on stream too. Um, like I, I talked about it while I was writing it because this was this was the one essay that I was really interested in writing um, during that period. I liked it. Um, like uh, the other one, Con Amor del Noir. It's like it's all right. Um, it, it's all it's 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 decent. It's got its place, but it's also like um, this one was like involved a lot of suffering to write and produce, and I was stressed out of my brain. This one, this one I actually wanted to write, so that's good. And this one, and this one, and this one. It's like figuring out essay, like that's almost the hardest thing, especially when you're sick, is like finding an essay you want to write. Because once you find have something you want to write, it can be a lot easier to write. Because um, it's like writing about like, er, like how to combat terrorism and how to like stop blaming the mentally ill for terrorism and like 
talk about radicalization instead and let's like let's focus on the real issue here that's a good that's a good topic that's a worthy topic um and it felt original it didn't feel like i was like retreading people other people's work or just re regurgitating because that's like ugh. regurgitating like regurg like writing an essay of regurgitation is vomitous is this how it is it's in the name or it's in the concept and then writing with like the struggle of like writing about mental illness or of writing about human rights and then we don't tell i mean i just spent like an hour reading it so it's like it's a pretty important essay to me um and the moral distress is really important to me too it's like it's less interesting and it's like i wish i hadn't been forced to like narrow it to like second language teaching specifically but it's like teachers in general just need better that's the main point of that essay like stop being mean to teachers guys please anyway um, uh, do you guys have any questions about any of that? It's like, that was a long, that was a long, long thing. Um, took an hour. Uh, oh yeah, and it's like, teachers are just way too undervalued and it's basically guaranteeing the death of like knowledge in our society, it's like, um, it's like the more, and it's actually like causing most of the knowledge acquisition our current generation is producing to go to waste. Because it's like, if you don't pass on knowledge, it's like it's just gonna go disappear within one generation. Woohoo. You spend your entire life researching, and like, if nobody transmits it, it disappears. And we only, and like, each generation has the exact same amount of time to learn. It's like, our children, like, we have as much time learn as our ancestors, uh, as our forefathers did, and uh, as our ancestors will, uh, as our descendants will. We have the exact same amount of time. Uh, we don't have advantages. Um, we kind of just gotta, uh, so it's like, if you cut, uh, if you decrease the amount that you're willing, um, uh, if, uh, it's like, if we have the exact same amount of time, how do you seriously expect to it's like if we do not improve our teaching, if we do not streamline our pedagogy, make it more efficient, make it more, um, uh, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. one moment, I need to find something. Um, uh, it, it, it's like if we do not, uh, stream, if we do not streamline or make more efficient our education, and we only have the exact same amount of time, it's just going to get more and more burdensome to become educated. It's like, it's like, like doctorate degrees are already taken heckin' forever. It takes so dang long. And it's like, it's like people don't have more life to enjoy or like to use that knowledge. Like we need improvements in pedagogy so that people can learn faster and get up to date faster. Um, to make, it's like, so that people don't spend their entire lives in the university system. Um, we need to improve pedagogy so that, like, knowledge isn't just outright lost. And if you're a researcher and you spend your whole life learning and doing and, like, building a better base of knowledge, that we don't just lose that and waste that, waste your entire work. Like, we're wasting so many people's work just with our the arrangement of our education. So, yeah. Fun. <laughs> uh.